All right, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining. It's a, a beautiful night, a wonderful Elam here. And to start, tonight is uh, actually, um, that came on perfect timing. Tonight is, firstly, it's my, uh, my one-year-old's birthday, Tuba Shvab. He's a Tuba Shvab birthday, so happy birthday, everybody. Um, tonight is Tuba Shvab, the birthday for trees. And um, our rabbis tell us, Ki Adam eats a sada that man is compared to a tree. And tonight we'll be learning about um, the wonderful growth that every person has, especially the speaker. Um, we're going to start off by giving charity. Our sages tell us that uh, when two people meet, we should do kindness for a third. So if one has a, uh, a charity box by them, preferably uh, the institution that uh, you're here with, Chabad or uh, B'nai Avraham. Um, we're going to start off with that, a little tzedakah, um, and uh, in the name of um, the sisterhood of B'nai Avraham and, Chabad, um, and Dira and Chabad of uh, Windsor Terrace, um, we want to thank everybody for making here tonight, we're very excited to have everyone here, and of course we're very excited to have Michal Ashman here. Um, to give us this talk. So to start off, um, we're going to have Rabbi Menashe Wolf from Dira. Um, he's going to start off with Psalm 121. Rabbi Menashe. So I can let's see what's going on. No, um, Rabbi Wolf, you able to unmute now? Yes. Fantastic. Hey everyone. You should have on your screen Psalm 121. And we're gonna read it together. So please join together with me. Mm -hmm. Shir la malois, Esa enai el heharim, me ayin yavoi ezri, ezri me imadinoi, oise shomayim varets, al yite la moidraglecho, al yonum shimrecho, hine la yonum la yishon, shomer Israel, adinoi shimrecho, adinoi tilcho, al yad yuminecho, yomam hashemesh lo yakeko, the oreach baloilo, I didn't know you smore a homie called Raw, you smore a snapshaho. I didn't know you smore a taste of the echo, the ato, the ad alum. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rabbi Menasha from uh, Dira. Rabbi Yanko, I want to interject that the reason we set the healing was to thank God for the amazing rescue of the hostages in Texas and that God should continue to protect. Am Yisrael, and all of his children throughout the entire world. Amen. 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 Um, we're going to continue now with Rabbi Moshe Hecht of um, Windsor Terrace, Chabad of Windsor Terrace. And um, because today is Tu B'Shvat, the birthday of the trees, the Shulchan Aruch, the Code of Jewish Law, mm -hmm. says that we should um, increase in eating fruit and making a blessing on it. And we're going to ask Rabbi Moshe Hecht from Chabad of Windsor Terrace to lead us in um, having some fruit for the holiday. Good evening, everyone. Happy Tu B'Shvat. It's great to see you all, familiar faces, and those faces that will be familiar uh, after this evening is over. I decided we're going to make a blessing today on one of the seven uh, species, one of the fruits that the land of Israel was blessed with. I chose the pomegranate, so I have a bunch of pomegranate seeds over here. And this is uh, appropriate for the full screen of uh, faces, of holy faces that I see in front of me. Like this cup is filled with pomegranates, the screen is filled with juice. So everybody, you can uh, join me with some wine, is also appropriate, some grapes, whatever you have, whatever you like. Baruch atah peri Amen.
All right, thank you very much, Rabbi Moshe Hecht. Um, so we did, we, we did a little prayer. We did uh, a little blessing. And now we're going um, to move on to our feature speaker and entertainment. So we're going to have tonight um, our MC, um, Mrs. Mrs. Brooke, who is going to um, run run all the questions and the program and um we are looking forward to it so without further ado your uh, feature presentation thank you rabbi raskin um and thank you uh, rabbi hecht and rabbi wolf for your words can everyone hear me okay i just want to make sure my connection is working yes the sound is good the internet is a little it's not the best if you have a better spot, but it's it will do. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, so before we start, I also want to thank Jira and Chabad of Windsor Terrace for co-sponsoring this event with the CBA Sisterhood. Um, it's wonderful to see the Jewish community of Brooklyn coming together tonight. My name is Brooke Bryant, and along with Holly Wolf, I'm co-president of the Congregation B'nai Avraham Sisterhood and a CBA board member. And I'm so thrilled to be with you all tonight. As a working mom who struggles to do it all, in fact, you might hear a baby squealing in the background because she didn't want to go to bed without me tonight, um, and a senior executive in my field who balances board meetings with diapers, bottles, and bedtime for a teething 11-month-old, I'm so excited to hear Michal's talk. I'm constantly navigating the anxieties of parents, re parenting, relationships, and work. There is no script for this. And Michal is an inspiration. Michal Oshman is a powerful businesswoman serving as head of company culture, diversity and inclusion, and employer branding at TikTok Europe, Middle East, and Africa. Formerly, she was a senior executive at Facebook, um, charged with leadership and team development, and she was also in a senior role at eBay. Throughout her career, Michal has coached hundreds of text leaders. She has three degrees in psychodynamic and systematic thinking, sociology, and anthropology, and to top it off, she's a mom of four. Michal recently published a book, What Would You Do If You Weren't Afraid? And she will be with us tonight to share her story and some inspiration in honor of Tu B'Shvat. A few words of format for today. We have a prepared Q&A session, and then about 10 minutes from the end, we're going to have questions from the audience. So if you have questions, please place them in the chat, and we'll take them um, at the end of the talk. And without further ado, I'd like to welcome Michal. Hi everyone, good evening or good, no good night if I saw someone from London, very late in London, good morning I would say. Uh, it's great to be here, thank you so much for inviting me and Brooke, I look forward to our conversation, mother to mother. Thank you, me too. And so to kick it off, Michal, um, here you are on paper, a successful married mo mother. Um, you're a fully functional woman in the workplace and at home, and you even go to therapy. What triggered you to feel that there was still something lacking in your life? What void was missing that you desired to fill? Well, that's a, that's a big question. And uh, in, order to, um, in order to answer it, I, I do need to ask to kind of take maybe four or five minutes just to share with, with, uh, with the audience um, who I am, because um, I think some context would be helpful. Uh, so um, I know that not, not everyone got a chance to, to read the book, and even if you did, um, so my name is Michal, uh, and thank you for pronouncing it so beautifully. And I'm originally from, uh, from Tel Aviv, from Israel. Um, I've been living in London for the last 17 years with my husband and four kids, Bo Hashem. And I know that today is a day of, uh, of celebration, celebration of, of Tu Bishvat, of growth, of trees, of, of fruit, of potential, of, of, of creation. Um, but I think in order, not but, and I think in order to consider growth and, and fulfillment, um, maybe a good place to start is with the beginning and the roots. So I do want to share with you uh, my roots and my uh, upbringing. Obviously, my roots, like our roots, roots go way back uh, before our upbringing. But I grew up in Tel Aviv and my house, uh, my household, the environment in my home um, was, was a very sad one, a very difficult one. My grandparents from all sides were Holocaust survivors. And I was very close to my grandmother, Hannah, who uh, really raised me together with my parents. We lived 
side by side um, grandmother Hannah and, and my grandfather. And grandmother Hannah, like all of my grandparents, um, survived the Holocaust and specifically Hannah um, was lucky enough and brave enough to jump off the train on the way to Auschwitz. She felt that something very bad was going to happen. And there are many people that felt that something bad was going to happen, but Betzafta Khanna jumped. She jumped off the train, she got injured, she was shot at, but she survived and managed to get to Israel um, and, and to build a family. But she was very much traumatized from the Shoah. And my first early memories of childhood were um, hiding food with, with my grandmother, um, honey, uh, hiding uh, tuna cans and, and baby formula. I was her first granddaughter. Um, she used to force feed me chicken soup. She prepared me for the next bad thing. And she was convinced that something was going to happen. It was only a question of, of, of when. And that obviously affected um, you know, my, let's say, mental health, well-being, um, and, uh, um, you know, like many other second and third generation. It didn't help, I guess, my mental well-being that my father was also a known figure in Israel. He was the head forensic pathologist um, uh, of Israel, and, um, uh, and I was exposed to death and, 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 and sad things and difficult things. And, you know, on a day like this of Celebration Day, you know, who wants to talk about these things? But, you know, these are also, um, this is part of life. And for many, many years, I um, struggled with anxiety. I was very, very afraid of everything that could go wrong. And every day that I woke up in the morning, I assumed that it was my last day. But I didn't want to disappoint anyone. And I didn't want my grandparents and parents to be sad. So I did the best to do, to be the best. Um, so I developed, I guess, a new kind of anxiety of not disappointing, the fear of disappointing, which I know many of us are familiar with. So I tried to be the, the best student and the best daughter and the best soldier. I was a, an officer in the IDF and the Israeli Defense Forces for three years. And, you know, I was highly, highly functional. And after that, I did all those degrees that you, you kind of very kindly mentioned, Brooke, and I got married and I even had three children. Now I have four, Baruch Hashem. But, um, but I was very sad inside and very, very anxious. Um, and at some point, at the age of 38, after going to therapy probably for almost two decades and taking medication, um, I looked in a place that I've left, never, never looked before. I never even considered looking um, for my well-being and for my mental health. And the story of this discovery is, is what I share in the book. Yeah, thank you so much. And what a story. Um, and to, to start it off, um, you know, your resume in life seemed perfect from the outside and so much aligned with what you said of being highly functional. You know, great jobs at, you know, world-class companies, multiple degrees, a family, a husband. But you also mentioned you've been suffering from mental health challenges. Talk to us about how those two things uh, can exist side by side, the mental health issues and such a kind of a functional, accomplished um, outer life. Yeah. So first of all, we never know what's going on in a person's life, right? Like we should be very, um, we all do it. Of course, we look at the outside or what the LinkedIn account looks like, or even, you know, what they look like, you know, walking around on the street and we make all sorts of um, assumptions. Um, and like many other people, I worked quite hard, I guess, to have that kind of persona to be kind of, you know, you know that seems like everything's going well. Um, I also think that the, you know, anxiety has different sides to it. And one of the things that one of the ways that I channeled my anxiety is to doing, um, but not doing from joy or doing from growth, or wanting to grow, doing from, from fear. Um, and I don't, and I think they're very different. They're very, very different of, of making, you know, taking action and, and making, I, I assumed what I knew from my house is that um, my home, as a child is that uh, we're not supposed to be happy. I thought we were supposed to, to live in, 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 in guilt and, 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 you know, and not to be happy. Um, and that really went deep into, into, into my essence. And very, you know, later on the journey, I realized that we are supposed to live in Simcha, you know, that living in joy um, is, is, is the way to live. And even if there's struggle, 
um, then, you know, we don't, we, we overcome it or we try to overcome it. And we, you know, we know that uh, if we're down today, it's only in order to be up tomorrow. Um, but those are things that I learned um, later on the journey. And so how were you exposed to Jewish wisdom? What is the Jewish wisdom? Is it, and um, how were you exposed and who is it for? Is it only for observant Jews or is it for all Jews? Yes, so I've, I feel very, very passionate about this. Uh, and that's obviously why I'm here today with you. Um, so I grew up, uh, first of all, I have an allergy of trying to box people. Uh, and I try not to do that because I don't like when people do it for myself, uh, to myself. But just to give a bit again of context, I grew up in a home. Obviously, I'm, I'm from Israel. Um, I grew up in a, in a Jewish home. Um, but, you know, I had no idea what Judaism meant in a spiritual um, way. I had no idea what were those holidays that we were celebrating. And, you know, we were mainly celebrating the holidays with food, but less about understanding, you know, what stands behind Pesach, Pes Passover, which is, you know, working on your ego or letting go, what stands behind Rosh Hashanah. And, um, so, you know, for me, really being uh, Jewish didn't mean that much. I was very respectful of my uh, identity and faith, but it, it wasn't something that we discussed, um, you know, or talked about um, at home. I also was brought up in a home where we um, didn't really practice Judaism. Um, so we didn't keep Shabbat or do Kiddush. My mother never lit Shabbat candles. So um, I guess I was culturally Jewish. And for anyone that has been in Israel, you know, in Israel, it's kind of in the air, right? And Yom Kippur, no one needs to tell you that it's Yom Kippur. There's no cars <laughs> in the road. So it's a, it's a different kind, I guess, of... Um, of Judaism. And for me, Judaism was mostly what people looked like, you know, or what they were allowed or not allowed to do. If you're wearing something or if you're eating something or not, it was kind of that black and white um, way. So I never considered um, Judaism for anything that has to do with my joy or my growth or my well-being. But at the age of 38, as I mentioned to you, when I was really concerned for myself and, you know, I, I want to... Um, I really believe in being honest and um, I wrote the book. I, I'm quite vulnerable in the book. Uh, I share my experiences, my mental health experiences. And the reason I do that is not because I have this uh, passion to share the most per private and personal experiences that I've had in my life or with my husband or with my children or with my parents. It's because I really want to normalize um, as much as we can mental, emotional experiences that people go to. So at the age of 38, as you said, Brooke, on the outside, it seemed like I have it all. And I really had so many things to celebrate for real, but inside I felt empty. And I was so ashamed of myself because I was at the same age of my Safta Khana when she saved her life, when she was shot at. And here I am living in London, having so many things to celebrate and I was still anxious and I couldn't let my children go on school trips because I was afraid that they're gonna god forbid and for me the only scenario was the worst worst case scenario so at some point I got worried about myself and about thoughts that I had in my head and I shared them with my husband and we really tried different things we tried buddhism and you know we tried everything we knew but on one um now I call it Shabbat, but then I call it Saturday. One Saturday morning, um, I saw a family walking to shul next to my um, neighborhood. And for some reason, they just seemed, um, you know, peaceful. Not that I'm saying that every family that walks to shul doesn't argue with each other or there's no disagreement and everything's beautiful. Like, you know, but that family looked really in a good place. So I opened my laptop and I typed, um, anxiety, fear, depression. And for some reason, in addition to joy and um, uh, happiness, I, I typed Judaism. And the search result took me to uh, Lubavitch, a uh, doctor in psychology, who does research on the connection between emuna, faith, um, and, and joy and simcha. And I reached out to her and she was the one that opened the door. She was the first one that opened the door to, um, to Chabad, to teaching, uh, to learning Tanya, 
Um, and if someone doesn't know uh, about the Tanya yet, yet, I'm very happy um, to share. And I'm sure that the rab rabbis and rabbitsons in this call um, can advise on how to start learning. But I do quote quite a bit from the Tanya um, in the book. So here I am, the city girl, um, as you said, having all these things. And I was advised to go to a Tanya shiur. And I arrived to the shiur and I was like, I don't know what I'm doing here. Everyone looks different to me. And they're lo learning from this ancient text. And, you know, I really felt I didn't belong in that room until the rabbi, Rabbi Gordon, started reading in Hebrew. And he said the words neshama and nitzotz. And he even said etzev, which is sadness. And 38 years or maybe more of sadness and fear just started coming out from through my ears with tears. And I, I, I literally cried for a few days and it really touched my soul. And I thought it was beautiful that from the Tehillim that we just read in the beginning, uh, when it says, uh, which is he will guard your soul. I didn't know I had a soul. You see, I had no idea that there were parts of me, a part of me, in me, a godly part in me, that regardless of all the things that I had seen or had been done to me, that part is as pure as it was in the beginning. I had no idea. As a child, I asked my father, who conducted 40,000 autopsies, um, if there is a smaller body in the bigger body that never disappears, even when the bigger body is buried. And he said, no, it's done. So I discovered that there was something there that I felt as a child. I just had no one to talk with about. So once you discover you have a soul, you know, uh, it's a game changer. Um, and I did a lot of learning and I'm doing a lot of learning. And please God, I have more time to do, learn and educate myself. But that was the door opening to me um, eight years ago. And you can imagine that when you make a discovery like this, it affects how you look about life, at life, how you, you know, how you want to raise your children, and also the things that you want to do from a practical point of view. So that that was a that was a life changing moment for me. Incredible. And before I'm before we go on to the next question about you, I would love to hear your your take on who Jewish wisdom is for. Is it just for observant yeah. Jews, or or who who, yeah. who is this for? Sorry, you asked me. I don't know. Tonight I'm a bit. More, I You're amazing. I asked you like a five-part question. So of you course. asked me. Normally I make notes. You see, that's the perfectionist. I, I'm going against perfectionism, by the way, Brooke, because uh, it just causes unnecessary anxiety. That's my um, resolution for the year, Michal. Unnecessary. Um, so who is this for? This is for. So my book is not a religious book. Um, and I don't think Judaism is only for Jews or only for practicing Jews. That's my opinion. Um, this, my book is a self-help book. It's a, it's a book that for anyone that wants, that is curious, A, eh, to learn about spiritual Judaism, that wants to discover that the fact that Judaism is, has a psychology in it. And with all due respect to Sigmund Freud, and I have a couple of degrees when I was all obsessed with uh, Mr. Freud or Doc, Professor Dr. Freud, um, he didn't start uh, psychology or you know, psychotherapy. Uh, Judaism has a psychology in it. And so does the Tanya, as, as I'm sure you know. And you know, these are, this is a wisdom that was created thousands of years ago, because you know what? It's not only now that we started feeling anxious and it's not only now that we started feeling jealousy and comparing ourselves to others and, you know, feeling empty, feeling people have been feeling this for thousands of years. And, you know, that's why we were giving this, given this wisdom to navigate life. The problem is, or the challenge is, or the opportunity is, depends on what day you ask me, is how to tell the story of the Jewish wisdom in a way that um, you know will appeal to anyone and everyone to want that wants to grow, and that's why I wrote the book. So, like you, Brooke, I was juggling with uh, my youngest was a real baby when I was writing the book, and I found myself at 11 p.m. after she finally went to sleep after I don't know a million times. Put I got a kind of glass of red wine, and I and I wrote the book. I wrote the book because it's it's my mission, and and what I'm trying to do now. 
through the book, but through, you know, conversations like this and, you know, sh share this beautiful wisdom with the world um, and universal wisdom. There, there is nothing that you can't learn from, um, uh, you know, regardless of your faith, non-faith, how you live your life, you know, your, your, any of your preferences, your life preferences, um, all of the ideas for the, in the book are very welcoming, I hope. Um, so the book's title is quite unusual. Why this title and what's the story behind it? So the book's title is What Would You Do If You Weren't Afraid? And I know that people ha will have a chance to take to get a copy, which were very kindly purchased by your community. And um, so the title, What Would You Do If You Weren't Afraid, is actually from Facebook. So, I mean, it's not originally from Facebook, but that's where I saw it and it really affected me. Um, so I, I started working for Facebook about maybe eight years ago, maybe more. Uh, now I work for, uh, for another tech company. And on my first day at Facebook, which was pretty much when I discovered the Tanya, and I'm not comparing Facebook to the Tanya in any shape, way or form, but it was just around the same time. When I realized, um, when I started studying Tanya, I realized, Michal, there is a chance that you will enjoy life. There is a chance, you still don't know exactly how, that you'll wake up in the morning and you'll breathe and your assumption will be that you will get to the end of the day and no tragedy will happen. And when I started working for Facebook, the big kind of sign poster um, that was um, on top of the kind of, uh, above the reception desk and all over the office is Facebook's internal mantra. And it asks employees, what would you do if you weren't afraid? And the assumption is that we are afraid. As humans, we're afraid of failing. We are afraid of letting go. We're afraid of not being smart enough, successful enough, you know, beautiful enough, anything enough. And, the, and you know, and, and that fear stops us from doing things because we don't want to fail. So maybe better not to do anything. So the company, in order to um, invite people to bring their creativity to the forefront, they say, you know, what would you do if you weren't afraid? What would you do if you weren't afraid? And then just side by side to that um, uh, poster, there's another poster that says fail harder, which again is an invitation and a reminder for people that if you go for your idea, if you try life, you will fail at some point, a relationship, an exam, a, a job. And at least if you fail, fail harder. Fail when you gave it everything you have, right? And I have this fear because there's this guy that left me on the day that I thought he was going to propose. Not, you know, this is many, many years ago, but I, I had a boyfriend and um, uh, after I served in the military and a couple of other jobs. And, you know, I thought he was the one. And, um, and, and on the day that I thought he was going to propose to me, he actually left me. And you can imagine the heartbreak and, you know, I can talk about that later, even though who wants to talk about that? Um, but then when I married my husband, I was really afraid that, you know, what happens? What happens if I fail, if it fails? But then I reminded myself that, you know, fail harder and no one wants to fail a marriage, but I'm going to give it everything I have. Every single day, I try to give as much as I have and, and also take. And of course, it's, you know, a relationship. So that, that idea of what would you do if you weren't afraid uh, really fascinated me. And that's why I, I called it, I, I named the book this way. And I also discovered that the, the DNA of the Jewish people is to be afraid, that's okay, but to overcome fear, to do. And for someone who was frozen inside for many years, that was a very welcoming approach to life to do. Incredible. Um, and the, it sounds like you were able to build so much trust in yourself through that process. Uh, but it's uh, all, also very hard to build that trust. Um, and trust in oneself is often tied to a higher power. How did you build that trust within yourself that, the, that you were able to look to faith? What steps oh, did you take? I love this question. I love it. I, I love this question. And I'll, I'll try, I'll try to answer it, even though I'm still really so much learning about this. 
So actually in the context of, of Tubishvat, so as a child, I used to, I'll try not to be emotional now because I only remember this today. I forgot about it and then I remember today. So as a child, I'm, I'm not good in drawing at all, um, but I, the only thing I used to draw are trees, just trees. And I remember that I used to draw, um, you know, the whole tree, but mainly the roots going deep down, you know, into the soil. And when I spoke with Rabbi Raskin a couple of weeks ago, ahead of this call, we were speaking about Tu Bishvat, and Tu Bishvat is a very um, special holiday in Israel. Um, it's actually one of those beautiful holidays that I do remember from school, because, you know, we know that we're living on a, on a holy land. And uh, regardless of which school you go to, you celebrate uh, Tu Bishvat with beautiful fruit, and the teachers remind us of our, of our roots um, and also the connection to Israel. And, um, and I think going to your question about, you know, how do you grow that trust or that confidence? I think what I've been working on in the last eight years is actually working on my roots. And the word in Hebrew for me is bitachon. Um, and bitachon is a really beautiful word in Hebrew. It does mean... I guess, safe, security or safety or trust. And if someone can help me on the call, tell me. But, you know, because I am an, uh, a, a Hebrew speaker, kind of, you know, mother tongue, what I realized is that, you know, when you have bitachon, when you know that there's Hashem and, you know, your connection, um, you get perspective. You get, um, uh, you know, you, you learn that you have an ishama right? You know that you're here for a reason. These are things that I learned, you know, I guess at a, at a, at a relatively old, older age uh, or more advanced, you know, some people learn this from very young age. So the combination of knowing that I have a soul and it's a go godly soul, knowing that I'm here for a reason also. One of the beautiful sayings in Hasidut which I say to my children, probably not often enough, but I should improve, is the day you were born was the day that the world was missing you. How beautiful is that? That we're not here by chance. I thought I was stuck into my family. I mean, you know, it, I just, I just didn't, didn't understand why I was needing to experience certain things. Now I know I was there because I was able to, to be here now. Um, so the idea that, and the belief that the day you were born, every single person on this call, and I think we have at least 120, uh, which is a beautiful number, uh, but probably more and more people will watch it later. So the hundreds of people that are watching us now or later, you know, we're all here for a reason. And the beautiful thing is that the day that we were born, the world was missing us, but every single day, that we're here, the world needs us to do something or to be someone. And suddenly I kind of shifted my focus from being quite obsessed about myself, my looks, my success, you know, what my outlook looks like and realized that I have a role to play here. And it's potentially beyond parenting and beyond, you know, being a, a wife and, you know, even though these are huge roles and, and, and that took down the anxiety. I think when I felt less obsessed about myself and showed more care and love for others, things are, and, and then with that came volunteering and doing Sdaka, which is things that I've never ever done before in my life. Slowly, slowly, it doesn't happen in a day, Brooke, and I'm sure everyone, no one would expect that, the anxiety started decreasing and, and the meaning started kind of going up. And like many people here on the call, I know that when you find more meaning in life, it can potentially reduce your anxiety. And I'm working on that as well. That's incredible. And how incredible that um, when you were able to have that kind of faith in yourself and your purpose that you could look outward uh, to help others, it's inspiring. Um, I would, I'm curious to hear how you translate and understand the word chuba and how you adapt this concept into your life. I love the, first of all, I love the word teshuva, just the word itself. Um, and teshuva is, is return to Hashem. But, you know, the, 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 the word is, comes from the word lashuv, to return. 
And I love the idea. And you can imagine that I spent quite a bit of time thinking about these things. I love the idea that we can each return to ourselves. The, the, the original selves, right? Before, let's say, life happened or before the things that hurt us happened. And the idea that I can return to that young, young girl before I heard things or saw things or, you know, I remember myself before. I just didn't, I couldn't put words, you know, to who I was. Um, but you don't have to go, you know, 46 years back. You can return to the potential of who you can be all the time, right? That's what we do to Shuva on Yom Kippur, right? It's an invitation. I see Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, as a beautiful invitation to, to return to yourself, to remind yourself, hey, Michal, you know, are you living the life you're supposed to live? Are you fulfilling, you know, yourself, your meaning? And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a good reminder. Now I understand that Yom Kippur is not a sad day. It's not a scary day. It's, it's a day of return. Um, and I think when we return to ourselves, we also get much clearer about what matters to us. And in, re and in connection to returning to yourself, I love the idea of forgiveness. And part of the journey that, I, so first of all, it's a Jewish invention. Uh, we invented forgiveness in case you didn't know, or we, or you know, any, anyone that identifies you know, with, with Jewish um, culture and wisdom. And it was actually in the portion a few weeks ago. Um, you know, th this idea that you can choose to forgive. And you know, sometimes it's very hard to forgive, or your, yourself, by the way, or others. Um, and some things are not forgivable. I don't know if that's a word in English, but I just made it, made it up. But part of my journey was to start, stop blaming my parents. I spent many, many hours and many, many dollars, um, you know, blaming my parents. And that's okay, because I needed that as well. But at some point when I went to therapy, I realized that I'm looking back all the time rather than looking forward, that I was spending a lot of my energy on blaming. And at some point, after I discovered Hasidut and Tanya, I actually made a decision to, uh, to, to let go, to forgive my parents. They didn't do, they didn't harm me, you know, on purpose. It was just the way that they were raised. And, you know, today we raised our children, we raise our children with lots of, uh, you know, we say to them all these words, you're beautiful, you're smart, you're, you know, I was raised for survival. And you know who can blame my grandparents and my parents? They, they, that was their mindset. So teshuva is an opportunity to return to yourself, to return to, to Hashem. Remind yourself that you're here for a reason. Ask yourself if you're living the life and behaving in the way that is best for your soul. And by the way, one more thing, Brooke. Sometimes when we're not feeling happy. And sometimes when we're sad, um, it's a way of the soul to send us a signal that we're not living the life that our soul needs us to live. It's, it's, just, it's just a wake up for the body um, that, you know, maybe we can make some changes, not huge changes, but like a change that, that can really help us um, inside. So I, I like that idea as well. Beautiful. That's all beautiful. So speaking of change, when someone wants to make a change, whether it's leaving a job, starting something new, how do they know if they're going toward or away from what they truly desire? And what are some of the questions that they should ask? Yeah. So this is where I, I'm, I'm always so grateful that my, you know, this wisdom that I discovered, uh, it, it can, uh, you know, connect between my personal life to my uh, you know, professional life, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and, um, and one of the things that, sorry, someone's just knocking on the door I'm in a hotel room. Uh, that's strange. Yeah, Ear, can you, sorry, I'm going to ask my husband to check. Yeah, Ear, can you see who's at the door? Sorry, they opened the door. Um, and one of the things that I, um, um, sorry, this was very weird, someone opening the door. Brooke, can you remind me what you asked? Just, just a hint. Sure. We were talking about change. And if someone's making a change, what are questions yeah. they should ask to reflect and see if they're going in the right direction? 
So actually, I love I love the idea of change and and you know and and how one can learn how to you know change and, and grow themselves or their careers or their family life. And I actually wrote about it um, a song that I love about change in the book. And uh, for anyone that you know has been to maybe you know a, uh, an event in like in shul or in a Jewish community, uh, you probably heard the song of the the, the narrow bridge. So I'm going to read it because it's actually on the back of the book. And it goes like this, it's short, and I'm not going to sing it, but it's beautiful song as well. The whole world is a very narrow bridge, a very narrow bridge, a, narrow, a very narrow bridge. And the main thing is to have no fear, to have no fear at all. So thinking about change, one of the beautiful ways of thinking of change is like, you know, thinking about a bridge, right? And, and kind of having that image of a, of a bridge. And when you're on one side of the bridge, you're obviously considering going to the other side, right? And what's between you here and your growth or your development is going through the other side of the bridge. And, you know, it's really helpful to take a minute wherever you are on the bridge and say, do I belong on this side of the bridge? Do I belong in this side? Is this, is this where I can be myself? Is this where I feel bitachon, right? Emuna, grounded, safe. Is this where I feel fulfilled? Is this how I can bring meaning to, to myself and to the world and to my community? Or do I belong more on the other side of the bridge? And I think once you consider where do you belong, where can you be yourself? Where do you have more chance to be the best version of yourself? You can know if you're running away from something or if you're actually going towards something. And I don't believe in running away from something, you know, especially in relationships, right? Sometimes you say, okay, I'll just, I'll just like, you know, I'll just end the relationship. But if it's something about you, you'll take it with you to the other bridge. So, you know, you're not solving, you know, you're just going to get exhausted from crossing bridges. So, you know, I try to bring this to life in my practice as a coach. Um, I try to bring it to life of how I make decisions and, uh, and hopefully for my children. That's the beautiful also element in Jewish wisdom. You can use it in, you know, in any part of your life. It's, a, it's it, you know, it's relevant. So uh, that, that's how I, um, I think about change. And, you know, I know we have so many people on the call now, so we won't be able to probably open the mics, but, you know, if anyone on the call wanted to, um, if you'd like to take a minute, uh, maybe even, you know, grab a pen and paper, um, or your iPhone, but just don't look at messages and just ask yourself, you know, what is a bridge that is in front of you now? A bridge could be leaving a job or starting a job. A bridge could be, you know, starting to learn something new. A bridge could be, um, you know, connecting with a community. So, you know, these, these are bridges and, you know, it could be helpful to think about what's in your brain, what's in your way to, to cross it. And, Sometimes, Brooke, I hear from people, I want, to, I want to meet my future wife. I want to do a career change. I want to, I don't know, get fit. But if you don't date, if you don't apply for a, you know, a new job or you whatever studying, and if you don't try to eat a bit less and exercise a bit more, you know, these things will probably won't happen. Um, so, you know, going back to the Jewish wisdom, it is about taking action. I'm not saying that it's easy. It's not. But one step on the bridge is, is already so impactful. Incredible. And I think um, such a clear, clear idea that we can all take into our lives. So when one looks at you, one sees a leader. Uh, we see someone through who all of her life experiences, you've chosen that role. What do you say to someone who shies away from leadership? I will say what the Rebbe said, which is everyone has the potential to be a leader. And one of the things, and is a leader. And sorry if I misquoted here uh, for people that are proper educators and not just me speaking from the heart. Um, but I really believe in that. I genuinely broke in all my Ramachavar, like everything that I have, I believe that um, everyone has the potential to be the leader. The problem is, that many people, when they think about leaders, they think about those people with a title CEO or president or head of something or the richest person. And then they immediately say, well, that's not me. But a leader is a person that leads an event in their community. 
a leader is a person that sees that someone needs help and they organize people around them to support. A leader is a person that wakes up in the morning and asks themselves, you know, what am I going to do now today for myself and for, and for others? And they take action. So I'm very, very passionate about changing, let's say, the um, mindset within people's minds about, about leadership. Um, and yes, I held formal leadership positions in the military um, and, you know, in, in companies, as you said. But actually, the leadership role that I'm most excited about is I'm the leader of my family. My husband and I co-lead our family. I'm the CEO and he's the CFO. He's also the person that just saved me when that person opened the door. So he's also my bodyguard. Um, keeping things real. You had your baby. I had someone opening the door. I was in total shock before, as you can see. Um, so, you know, we, we lead. We lead all the time. You know, you, you're leading now, Brooke, right? So, you know, we just need to, we need to change the, you know, the mindset and knowing leading is to do something meaningful for yourself, but mainly for others, caring for others and um, not obsessing about yourself. And I think, you know, that just opens the gates to lots of leaders. It's beautiful and so powerful to think that we can all lead in whatever sphere that we're in. Um, just so for everyone, as time is ticking and flying with this amazing conversation, I have two more questions for Michal. And if anyone has a question, I would encourage you to put it in the chat. Um, we're hoping to have a few audience questions at the end. Um, so penultimate question, Michal, to start to pull everything together, what tips can you give us to feel better about ourselves and realize our potential? Yes. So one, so in addition to the things that we touched on, right, that, you, you know, understanding that you have a godly soul, Underst deep understanding, deep understanding that you have a godly soul, understanding that your soul and you are here for a reason, you're here to be, to do, to be, you know, you, you have an opportunity, every single day is a new opportunity. Now, I know it sounds, but there's a beautiful saying in Hasidut that a person may arrive to this world for 70, 80 years, just to do one favor for someone else. It's that mindset. It's a mindset shift. Um, so kind of, you know, adding these ideas, the day you were born was the day that the world was missing you. Every day is an opportunity to return to yourself, to Shuva, right? So these are like the elements um, that I've been kind of added, adding in my mind. What we haven't talked um, much about um, is meaning. And one of the books and one of the scholars that really deeply um, inspired me and was supported by the Lubavitcher Rebbe and probably would never publish his world-changing, life-changing book called Man's Search for Meaning is Viktor Frankl. And Viktor Frankl shared his experience in, in Auschwitz and in, in other camps um, during the you know, horrendous events of, of the Holocaust and what he learned in his research, he was a doctor uh, in, in uh, neurology, I think, and also a psychiatrist, a uh, student of Sigmund Freud. What he learned from the unbearable you know, reality of, 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 of the Holocaust is that the, the people that had a greater chance to survive and that had, a, 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 a let's say, a greater resilience to try and live one more day because you know it wasn't in people's control if they survived or not, of course, but had that resilience to stopping them from running, let's say, to you know, ending this whole thing, because why, why live or pretend live in these circumstances? We're actually the people that found purpose in Auschwitz. And a purpose could be to write about Auschwitz after the war. A purpose could be to reconnect with your family. And Viktor Frankl himself writes that what was keeping him alive was his life for uh, love for his wife. Unfortunately, he discovered that she was murdered um, after he was um, rescued, but it kept him alive. I kept Viktor Frankl alive for, for the five or six years that he was, um, uh, five years um, that he was um, there. So for people to know that actually it's really healthy and it's good for our mental health and well being and could potentially reduce anxiety if, if we find meaning. And it doesn't have to be that meaning, I have a startup company, meaning I'm an exec, right? It's, it's that everyday meaning uh, and meaning changes. 
right? Sometimes your meaning is to be a parent. Another day is to learn. The third day is to do something for your community. So adding all those together, if people are happy to do like the work, and it is work, it's avodah, uh, which is work in Hebrew, um, I think that great things can happen. And on top of all of that, or the core of all of that, is a decision if, if you know, if, if you want to let yourself, you know, connect to Hashem and, 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 and to live a, a spiritual life. Beautiful um, and su such a clear pathway and things we can remember every day. Um, my last question, and then we do have a couple from the um, from the audience, is if there's anything you would el else you would add to bring the learnings um, that you've shared today into Tu Bishvat. I know you touched on a few ideas of the roots and Bitachon, but is there anything else that that ties these learnings into Tu Bishvat that you'd share? I'm actually so, I, I don't like I'm so inspired by Tu Bishvat. I actually went to one of our shops, uh, our fruit shops, and probably bought every single fruit there that I haven't eaten for a year. And I, I'm looking at this fruit that I don't even know what it's called, but, you know, I'm curious about it. Um, but I think, you know, I'm curious about it. I'm also curious about how I can grow this year. You know, how I can grow, you know, as, you know, as a tree with hopefully beautiful, meaningful leaves and fruit. And I know I have potential um, sometimes I'm afraid. <laughs> I should have read my book when I'm afraid. But I think Tu Bishvat is such a beautiful reminder to all of us that, you know, we are like trees. We have potential to grow. If our roots are deep inside and we know who we are and why we are here, um, you know, the branches and the fruit, because of endless growth ahead of everyone here on the call today and anyone that's going to watch this. So that's how I'm feeling today in, in this Tu Bishvat. Oh, beautiful. So we do have um, four minutes left and a couple of questions. I hope you don't mind if we take. Um, so Maya asks if you feel like you draw on your Jewish values in your coaching at work, even possibly before your spiritual Judaism insight. Thank you, Maya, for asking. So I think I didn't have the knowledge uh, like at all, before I actually started studying. So for ideas that I try to bring today, for example, ideas of humility, um, I, I probably started bringing them in the last, last eight years through, through my learning, uh, my learnings. I think what I did bring to my coaching practice probably before is this, um, um, I guess more identity coming from, um, you know, the, the home that I was raised in, um, right? A lot, a lot of black and white, which wasn't really good, but I knew that many leaders, potentially like myself, do a black and white and, um, and, and trying to kind of navigate between those two. Um, but I, I actually think, I hope I'm improving now that I've, I have a, a really special new um, tool in my toolbox called, called Jewish Wisdom. Beautiful. Um, and Kara asks, you spoke about how you would do from a place of anxiety, shame, or fear. What are some tools that you use to manage this and to instead do from that place of joy? Oh, <laughs> uh, it's work in progress. Uh, I'll be totally honest. I know my default is to go to doing from fear. I actually know that. So First of all, knowing is often, you know, I know it's a cliche, but knowing is often like half of it, half of the, you know, growth. And, um, um, and um, I challenge myself in my head, right? These are thoughts that I have in my head. I ask myself, um, I, I was always curious about the ego. But once I learned about, you know, the, the, the two forces that we have in, inside my, ourselves, myself, I'll talk for myself, uh, I think everyone has a, a good inclination and a less good inclination and the tension between them. I realized that this, first of all, I normalize this tension, right? And in my case, it's sometimes to try to achieve something out of fear or competition or, you know, jealousy. Or so when I, when I can feel that side of me kind of, you know, showing its face, I challenge myself and I say, can I channel the huge energy that I have? And oh, Hashem, I'm blessed with energy. And please God, I have that many, many years ahead. How can I channel this energy, not from that competitive jealousy, 
less helpful, anxious side of me, but more from the side of me that wants to grow something, that wants to do something, you know, for, for good, as, as well as satisfying myself. I'm not, I'm not ashamed to say I, I like growing, I like doing things, I like being impactful. Um, but that's kind of a, you know, a mind shift in, in, in my head. And sometimes actually, Brooke, and I'll say that very quickly, I'm about to do something and I ask myself, you know, where, what part of me is it coming from? And, and do I want to channel that part? And I stop. It often happens when I have an argument with my husband, which I'm sure that no one on this call ever, ever had or will have in the future. I share in the book that my tendency is sometimes to get angry a little bit too fast with my children. And I practice in my head how I can channel my passion and care for my children, not through anger, but just to educate them in a more pleasant way. So it's a lot of hard work, I guess. And sometimes you get it right and sometimes you don't. Incredible. So one last, very hopefully quick question from Rabbi Wolf. He asks if there are any other books um, that you would recommend us read to dive into these topics other than your own. So first, so I'm so humble that people are actually reading my book. You know, when you write a book, you'd like, I'm, I actually wrote it so my children have the book. Uh, so I'm really grateful that people are actually reading it. And uh, yeah, really, thank you so much. Um, you know, I learned a lot from the Tanya. Um, I, re I read a lot from Chabad.org. Um, every time there was a holiday or a moment, I um, like even a birthday, uh, we started celebrating in a different way. I also very much love the writing of um, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, Sichon um, who was the chief um, rabbi in, in the UK where I live, um, and obviously wrote beautiful books about leadership and obviously was very much inspired by the Lubavitcher Rebbe and thanked the Lubavitcher Rebbe for guiding him to go on the journey that ended up with these beautiful uh, books uh, and, and his big role that he held um, for passing a year ago. So, um, and I'm, if I'll think more, um, I'll, I'll, I'll share and we'll be able to email people if that's okay. incredible. Well, Michal, thank you so much. Um, this hour has flown by, but it's been so much inspiration for me personally, and I think for everybody on the call. So thank you so much for making the time. Um, you've given us a lot to think about as we move, um, move forward, um, hopefully towards the spring very soon. I also want to thank one more time the Congregation B'nai Abraham Sisterhood and Rabbis Raskin, Wolf, and Hecht and their families for making this event a possibility. We're wishing everybody a meaningful Tu B'Shvatz um, and hope to see you very soon at another event. Laila Tov and thank you again to Daraba Michal. Laila Tov to Daraba everyone.